Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to Stock Career in Kerbal Space Program 1.8. We are on day 8 here and we were in the midst of missions headed out to Duna. We have uh, two Kerbals, one on the Muffin, which will land on Duna, and another on the Ike McMuffin, which, as indicated by the name, will land on Ike in order to bring back this Duna Ejecta, whereas the Duna mission will bring back Blueberries. Also, we have an Ike base, uh, which actually is to fill orbital station around Ike, which is here. But then we will uh, land on Ike afterwards, hopefully, if it has enough fuel. So, that is the plan, but we're juggling those as well as an EVE probe. While those are on their way out, I am going to uh, deal with the EVE probe. I'm going to jot down the order of operations here. So for Ike base, let me just write it down. Uh, should I use this page? I'll use this page. Ike base, that's uh, 323 days, four hours. And then the muffin is, uh, so muffin is 307 days. And then the Ike McMuffin is 222 days for its maneuver. So anyway, we have plenty of time to do stuff around Eve first. So let's focus on our Eve probe. Break until KSB2? Well, you know, you could play stock. I don't... But yeah, breaks are good too. Uh, we need to fulfill the science data from Space Run Gilly mission is all, and then maybe we can dip this into the atmosphere. Um, we could correct inclination and then meet up with Gilly some other way, but... Oh, why don't we just correct the bloody inclination? Then we can bring it down. Oh, uh, no, down. Uh, what? I should have still brought it down. Wait. That's the retrograde marker. This is the prograde marker. Okay. Hmm. They both seem to be doing prograde. Now, pushing this in does retrograde. Pushing this in also does retrograde. I don't understand. Oh, for all mankind, okay. Yeah, no, I'd hate alternate histories because they always get aspects of it wrong in order to come up with their own particular view. Look, okay, so I'm gonna take this and pull down with it. Okay, and that increased our our ascending node, right? I'm gonna take this and pull up with it, right? The opposite of the other way. And it still increased our ascending node. I mean, pull this and go down, it's... I don't understand. Because people have used fake history to justify things before, so I don't like it at all. I just don't. No, once, once people start mangling history, I mean, it's all fun and games until it justifies something icky. Well, why are they telling that story, though? I mean, and just the particular way they tell it will be mangling things and misrepresenting things. By definition. Like, even if, you know, there was certain premises placed in there to allow for their fiction, it will have... It'll be messed up. Because what, what the alternate histories purport to do is they say, well, if this little one thing was changed, all this would flow from it. But that's not how it works. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's not like if, if uh, you know, uh, if, if Kennedy wasn't assassinated or something like that, you know, they, they, they proceed then to ignore a whole bunch of other stuff and deliberately ignore a whole bunch of other stuff flowing from that. And then, in in the process of ignoring all that other stuff, uh, they basically wipe out the whole slew of history. And make it seem like, if, if, if just this one thing happened, then all that other stuff would have happened this way. But that's not how it is. Because you've ignored a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, but history doesn't work like the butterfly effect. History is sort of self-normalizing. 
In other words, instead of uh, turning on a on a you know accelerating trajectory, instead of being chaotic, history is not a chaotic system. History is a self-normalizing system. It tends towards a normal, so it wouldn't be a butterfly effect. Is the whole point? Good old beasts. Well, I mean, I I'm very slow to update things. Okay, um, I'm talking away here. There's an alternate universe. It doesn't matter. Well, if it are people, people, we wouldn't have survived as a species if history wasn't self-normalizing. I mean, if it was, if it trended towards chaos on a single change, then we would just rip apart. I mean, <laughs> you can't have history be a chaotic system. No, it is an alternate history, but it ignores the sort of basics. For instance, I mean, it's like ignoring the basics of the Russian economy at the time and stuff like that. I mean, there's just... There's too much that's just gonna be messed up. I mean, it's not a matter of what, what history is. You're misunderstanding what history is. History isn't like science. You know, you aren't, you aren't like throwing... It's not like when a science fiction writer ignores some science. There aren't any rules to history. There aren't any... Uh, what you don't understand is there aren't any rules to history. All there is is the psychology and... You know, the re realities of being human. Uh, you're, you're treating them like robots, like, like playing pieces on a board. That you can rearrange them however you want. And they'll do what you want because you have, you have this view uh, but, but it doesn't work because they had these personalities and they, they had these realities that they were tied to. We're talking about why I hate alternate history. Um, so either you, you know, respect the fact that they're human beings and that we have human systems and that the United States had a certain character as a country and then the Soviet Union had a certain character as a country and that the Soviet Union, if you say that that's the Soviet Union, it has an economy, it has its own character, it has its own thing going. You either respect that, or you should call it something else, right? I mean, either you respect that John F. Kennedy is a certain kind of person, or he's not. Uh, you, you, you might as well just come up with a fictional president then, if you're not going to respect that, you know, he's going to tend in a certain way. Determinism, well, there, there's, there's a certain f room, room for fudge factor, but I, like I said, I believe that history is self-normalizing. It will tend towards, it's not chaotic. I mean, as a sci-fi writer, I like multiverses. As a historian, I don't. Can't judge it with our history. Yes, you can, and that's what they're doing. You see, when they create an alternate history, they are judging it with our history. You don't appre I mean, what they're saying is that they're judging with our experience. You can't even understand what's going to be happening in an alternate universe. If the rules are different, the rules are different. But they're using our rules and then rewriting it. And usually they say that you can tweak a little thing here, like one person dies here or uh, a horse doesn't get a nail here and then it changes history, right? That's the premise. They're using our rules. They're not using rules that you can't understand in an alternate universe. If if you were using rules from an alternate universe, viewers wouldn't be able to understand it because the characters wouldn't be making sense. Reporting of facts without judgments, right. But the facts are interconnected. You know, you can't just say, oh, th we'll change this one fact. If you change this one fact, it is, to some extent, fundamentally deterministic. The reason that fact was there was because of all the other facts around it, right? It wasn't that this fact could have changed in a way that would change everything else that flows from it, because the changing of the fact requires previous facts to have also changed, and previous facts before that to have changed, all the way back. The only reason we don't know why, what, what's going to happen is because we have incomplete 
information, right? We are not, I mean, it's a debate whether we are like quantum systems that are potentially non-deterministic. But that's less of a problem if when you aggregate all our little quanta, right? I mean, because we're like averaged out, we tend to be more deterministic. And especially when you talk about large human systems, where you average out all the personalities and different stuff with different people, we tend to be fairly normalized. Things are going to happen the way they happen. I mean, uh, to say that, you know, this one thing changed in the middle, they're pretending like that didn't require a whole bunch of other stuff to have changed before that. And that they're not talking about a completely different place. With completely different... The Soviet Union might have been a democracy. I mean... China's... Well, he's just coming up with a reason to... Get money. <laughs> so... I appreciate his efforts, but... And actually, that's why I sort of support not necessarily... Um, cooperating with China because we have to have that sort of competitive thing. Fear as a motivator is the only time it ever worked. The only the only time we actually went to the moon was when uh, we we need competition. I mean, I don't know about fear, but we need some competition. Populations evolve not in right exactly. So you're summing over large groups of people. I mean, a person a person can be very chaotic and seem non-deterministic but once you sum over large populations we we tend to have to normalize our behaviors in order to get along and we we have to make ourselves more predictable in a society in order to get along and the the side effect to that is that things are more predictable not communists well, I mean, you would have to have something fundamentally different f uh, in the Soviet Union. It would not be the Soviet Union that we know if they had been able to get to the moon and land a person on the moon. That was just not there because the only money they were getting really was for military purposes and there was great reluctance to fund any sort of moon mission and they got scant money. I mean, it was cobbled together. They couldn't afford test stands, they couldn't afford, uh, you know, to test the N1 stage all at once. They, and, you know, the engineers at the time said, we're just not, this. they're not giving us what we need to do it. So, I mean, they knew that they weren't getting it. It wasn't like some... Some random thing. So, you, you have to have something pretty seriously different at the top to allow that to happen and they were uh, if if america didn't get there they, they definitely weren't gonna try anyway it was only because america was looking that it might succeed that they even got any money at all revolutions are particularly easy i mean would would there have been no terror without robespierre no there would have In parallel to Einstein. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's orders of magnitude uh, harder than, you know, having independence. Now, that's no nothing to take away from Ataturk. I mean, he, he, had, he had a particular personality that, uh, that shaped Turkey in ways that, uh, I mean... I don't know how different it would be. We would have to have known who the other person was, but there were, I can tell you right now that there were ways that Turkey could not have ended up, right? That there's a, the small, there's a small area in the field of probability that Turkey could have ended up. And then there's a whole lot that couldn't have happened. And it's actually a fairly tight circle. What can happen to a given country at any given time. And it's not very broad. Turkey could not have gone to the moon, right? I mean, you can create whatever alternate history you like, but it, it just isn't... They're, they're just factors, you know? Istanbul's nice. I... It's an epic place. 
walking on the sun right now. Uh, there's a song about that. No, I'm <laughs> Founder of Smash Mouth. Uh, okay, we are in Gilly's... No? Wait. Oh, is it the next pass? What? Oh, okay. But, but, okay, right. That's not it. The uh, Gilly's still off. Okay, it's the next pass. Where is Gilly? It's still over there. Jeez. Okay. But let me make clear that as a sci-fi writer, I go with the multiverse. But I'm very careful about its consequences. The character that can go from one reality to another gets that ability in this book, right? But practically instantaneously, he realizes that as a result, nothing he does matters because, you know, if he saves somebody's life in one reality, that person will die in another. But, and, and so he will save that person's life. The question is whether that uh, somehow affects history. And so... The one thing I never say in there is that any particular event affects history. You know, affects the way things turn out at a macro level. You can save a person's life, but uh, or kill somebody in a particular reality or another, or do whatever deed you may choose. About the assassination of JFK? As it is, LBJ continued to do I haven't read the book, but even as it is, LBJ tried to do what Kennedy... We don't actually have to make Orbit here. You know, purported to want to do. And JFK himself, I mean, it's not like LBJ would have not been allied with... You know, if uh, some people say that uh, if LBJ... Uh, if uh, JFK hadn't died, then LBJ wouldn't have gotten the support for all those programs. But that's bogus because LBJ was a master of getting things done in the, in the Congress, and he would have still been an ally of uh, of uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, his vice president, trying to get things done. I mean, he wouldn't have been any less eager to get things done and have that influence. Um, and JFK on his own was a very compelling character and um, he could have got, I mean, there's no reason to believe that after a few years, he wouldn't have uh, also been able to sway, sway Congress to do his bidding too, just in his own right. I mean, he was a little bit of a novice initially, but that doesn't mean that he wouldn't eventually have been very effective. So, ultimately, they would have gotten the same things done, they would have done the space race because LBJ wanted it, they would have been sucked into Vietnam still, because they uh, he had the same national security advisor, and there was pressure from the Republicans in order to get sucked into Vietnam, and there was a lot of military money involved. So, basically, everything stays the same. <laughs> I mean, you would have still had the hippies because of Vietnam, you still had rock and roll, there's just... And mind you, I tear up uh, hearing Walter Cronkite, you know, announcing the assassination of JFK. Still, I mean, I'm very affected by it. But, you know, it's sort of um, he was a friend of mine kind of thing. Because, I, I, first of all, I feel, I feel for, what you call it, um, the people who were listening to it at the time. And... You know, I, I see it through their eyes, but also I respect him as a person. Yeah, I mean, well, let's let's take Nixon. Would Nixon have not engaged in a space race? Of course he would. In fact, it would have been it was the Eisenhower thing to uh, proceed with the space race. Would Nixon not have done social programs? He would have done social programs. He he actually created the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, he would all this stuff. Would he have not gotten sucked into Vietnam? Of course he would have gotten sucked into Vietnam. The Republicans would have pressured him just like anybody else. Goldwater was still to his right. 
even a great leader cannot get people to do just random anything, right? The, the, the leader appeals to certain trends in the way people think already, right? I mean, those those trends do not come out of nowhere. He didn't, uh, he or she did not create those ideas. They just tapped into them. Now, you can go well. But what if the Soviet Union didn't launch Sputnik first? That is a societal thing. That's a large-scale thing. That's not a one-person making a difference thing. And then once you get into something that big like the Soviet Union launching Sputnik first, there's a huge array of reasons why they launched Sputnik first. And then you've got this huge compounding um, sort of change in chain reactions if you try and change that. So you can't just... Uh, change Sputnik not happening. There's just thousands of good reasons why Sputnik had to happen right there. <laughs> so, wouldn't have actually changed anything? But yeah, but still, that's one that you can't touch very easily. Oh, the mirror mod. Oh, uh, did I get that link? I, I didn't even catch that, Barafel. Sorry. I think last night I was a little bit in over my head on many things. Uh, uh, can I get you to link that again? If you have it ready. Anyway, we have to do science around Gilly. Deeply reprehensive of the United States and would have justified the space race. Well, it wasn't Russia that justified the space race. We justified the space race. They felt that they won the space race. Um, uh, but... I think... I mean, if you had the huge societal effects that would have led Sputnik to not happen... That's that's too difficult. <laughs> that that that's where you're gonna get into a huge mess at that point. Um, we can transmit null science. They'll probably fulfill the contract. Yeah, but maybe we should land on Gilly and do that goo. I mean, we've got four goo, cons but transmitting goo sucks. But I guess while we're here. And Gilly takes a long time to land on. What, the guy with the fireworks chair? I'm just gonna point it directly at the ground, because otherwise it's gonna take forever to actually hit Gilly. One of the reasons why uh, space accomplishments were such a big PR boost... It was a much bigger PR boost in the Soviet Union than it was in America. You know, American public wasn't really that captured by the space stuff, but this, the Soviet public, public was very enthusiastic about it. That's one of the things, one of the bigger factors involved. Um, preferably from engineer problems and solving it. It's difficult because engineers, you know, don't... And you have to sort of pick an area. I have a book by a guy who worked on the engines on various... Uh, like the J2 and F1 and all that stuff. Um, it's not a very detailed book and good book because, again, it, he's an engineer. But no, not well. Ignition would be good. Ignition is a good book um, for. Yeah, I mean, but with the question being specifically about engineers, well, there is one from an engineer, but I I don't know if it's the best read or not. It's fairly sparse, but. He certainly was an engineer that worked on the stuff, and is talking about... Let me find it for you. The problems and solutions. It's just that he doesn't have all the flowery stuff that normally goes, so I mean, he doesn't have all the other stuff. So it's a very thin narrative. Just because the property is on somebody, I mean, the, uh, uh, what you got? Baikonur is leased, so it's still technically Russian territory. It's like a, sort of like an embassy. Baikonur is leased for a certain amount of time. So it works as, uh, well, okay, yeah, it depends if some of the other stuff is outside of Baikonur. There's this one by Tom Kelly and Tom Kelly really was the lead engineer 
on the Apollo Lunar Module. Oh, don't worry. I mean, the reason I burned straight to the ground is that Gilly takes forever to land on. And we really have to watch out for this antenna. Um, we still need it up. Otherwise, we can't communicate. So it's, it's going to be a little bit of a complicated landing. Yes, in ignition qualifies. Ignition qualifies. And that's very well written. That's probably the best written engineering history that I've seen. It might, it might. But this probe has de uh, technically completed its mission already, so... Everything else is gravy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to read that one, Tom Kelly's book. I mean, if you guys have uh, seen From Earth to the Moon, you've, uh, there was an entire episode that included, uh, you know, Tom Kelly designing the Lunar Module, right? I mean, they had a whole montage of him uh, trying to reshape that thing. I don't know if you guys remember that episode. And him standing proud. So he was a big character in that series. And for him to have written a book on it is pretty good. I didn't get to, that was a little bit early for me, Barafel, to watch the Antares launch. Yeah, new Gilly texture is pretty decent. Person who didn't know the answer. Yeah, yeah, people need to be encouraged. I mean, that's sort of what I try to do in my videos. Show that I don't know the answer, I'm trying to figure things out. It's amazing how many people are really... Um... Offended that I don't already know the answer, <laughs> uh, but a Turkish cosmonaut? I'm I'm surprised they didn't have one already on a so. Well, I guess uh, you know they they weren't really part of that. Uh, they weren't really non-aligned, so they should have had one on a U.S. one though. It's, I'm shocked that it's, which got they didn't launch in a space shuttle at some point. Always know the answer because. Expert, you know, on YouTube you normally think of experts, right? I mean, you go like, you know, the Scott Manley, you know, he's uh, he's telling you all about the game. He's telling you things about the game that even the game developers didn't know, right? That's how YouTube usually works. Yeah, well, a lot of people aren't used to that. Oh, uh, well, the mission is already complete. We already transmitted science from space around Gilly. I'm just trying to land on Gilly for as a bonus, Bill. But we have to watch out for this antenna. I don't know, you could probably make a deal with SpaceX, too. You know, like, uh... Like, uh, we'll pay you to launch our commsat, and, uh, you get us a seat on a Dragon 2, <laughs> kind of thing. They should make that sort of package deal, darn it. But the question is, have I already ran landed on the moon? I mean, is this the surface, or... Space near. Well, transmit that. Yeah, transmit. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't do that. Oh, oh. Oh, that doesn't have a collider! Oh, okay, I understand. Okay, this might be easier than I thought. Okay, let's get that one ready. We're gonna have to wait until Gilly actually brings us back down, unfortunate. Gosh, that, that was not a bounce. I used throttle. It's not throttle... It's not throttle... I mean, it's not a bounce if I use throttle. There we go. Out there eventually. It's not an assisted bounce. It's an aborted landing. Oh, please, don't turn Gilly into a food product as well. I'm gonna get too hungry. So I made potato bread yesterday, and I basically... I made them into sort of bun shapes. And basically this morning I made a Hot Pocket. I sort of cut slit in it and shoved in pepperoni and cheese and sauce. And 
And you know the wonderful thing about making your own Hot Pocket? It doesn't burn your mouth when you get it out of the microwave. <laughs> Doesn't try to kill you or anything, you know, like a normal Hot Pocket does. How many gillies? That doesn't sound good, especially in light of the character from Game of Thrones. Bop was it? I've run out of chocolate. I already ate all the leftover Halloween chocolate after passing it out, so... I'm chocolate deficient at the moment. It's still in space near, gosh darn you. It... Stop it. Stop with the bounce. Um... Come on, this is landed. Ah, here we go. Islands. Um... Maybe we should keep it. I don't know if transmitting is safe. We've got power though. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Alright, barometer. Well, let's do a seismometer. This is the first time we will have done a seismometer, I think. Ooh, that takes a lot of power. Um, I don't think we have enough power for that, actually. Even if we're full up. I know. Uh, the slightest bounce. But the first one wasn't a bounce, so it was only one bounce. I love how one antenna is pointing at the ground and the other is actually clipped into the ground, but we, we can communicate, it's fine. You wouldn't want the center of mass to be your reference point for landing, because then half of the body- Whoa, God! Because then half of the body would be clipped into the surface, or half of the mass would be clipped into the surface if the center of mass was landed. Uh, okay. So that sort of thing still happens. Oh yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, anything? Oh gosh darn it, it's too much. I should throw all that thing down. This is where I need an ant engine. Yeah, NASA, NASA's got a lot of nice history books. There's a monolith here? And how do you use the probe core to find a monolith? Little cow? Oh. I did not know that. Is that what I think it is? Oh yeah, yeah, rockets and people. Yeah, I've, I've read uh, most of volume one of that. Yeah, no, when, when I say, uh, you know, the Soviet engineers themselves did not think they were getting enough money to land a person on the moon, um, well, oh gosh, darn it, I can't. Um, that would be one of the sources, yeah. That four volume history, I, when doing the mission profiles, I looked through if uh, he had anything to say on the missions too. Um, you know what, we can land on our nose. That's not a problem. And I think one meter per, oh, no, this is not your nose, this is not your nose? We may bounce. Oh, or do whatever this is. We're, we're gonna lie down. We're gonna lie down. Okay. Well, we can get uh, goo from other places. Okay, how do I find a monolith? Because I really don't go hunting for Easter eggs. And what do you mean use the probe core to do it? Uh, you need to use curb net thingy built in all probe cores. Okay, well, probe core. In curb net access. I've never used this. <laughs> it's like, see, I never run out of things to do in Kerbal Space Program because I willfully ignore half the things. Alright, so what am I supposed to do? Um,. As it passes over terrain, it has a chance to find anomalies. Well, we're headed south, so that'll be good for covering places. High polar orbit. 
Um, what am I looking for on it? Oh, okay, yeah, let me move it. I guess I can close this right now. You have to have upgrades to use Anomaly? Oh, okay. So I don't... I don't have the... the power. I can find it with this core? Okay. So if I just keep going, eventually I'll... I'll find it? Is that what you're saying? Oh god, but this is gonna... Gilly is the last place I wanted to do anything like this on because it takes forever because of the time warp restrictions. Gives you... I don't want random tech though. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe we should wait until the end when I already have all the stuff unlocked. There's like a dot right in the middle of that circle there on Eve. That's so tempting. I just want to go right at that. Shall we go to Eve instead? I think I would rather go to Eve. We're going down right now. Oh, that's not... Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, do that. It's fine. <laughs> I know... Uh, yeah, I gathered it was a crater, but it's this very suggest suggestive crater. Landing directly at it would be very difficult in Eve's atmosphere, though. Bluegill. I don't know how close we have to be, but I'm gathering pretty darn close. I don't think that's gonna be, like, easy. This one? Oh, okay. Oh! Okay, well, let's see what we do on this pass. We'll have to bring this- uh, we really want it to be on this side. Not our periapsis side, because the periapsis side would be out of communication unless the other Eve probe works. Well, at the very last moment... Zoom out. I mean... How far out can you be while- and still see the... thingamajig? Offline? Oh. Oh no! Oh no, we lost communication right when I was burning. Well, this one is doomed. Well, it'll be in whatever orbit it ends up in after we finish this burn. Which should still be in orbit. But it'll be just scanning and not doing anything else. I guess we have to sort of wait though. It's not like ScanSat and that ScanSat... You have to, um... I mean, you get all the results at the end, you can just leave the satellites be and they'll scan for you. And you don't have to pay attention to it. EVEX... well, they said rover. They want a rover. I didn't even notice that heating was a problem. I know the Moon Arch, I've flown by it. UFO at the North Pole. Okay, uh, spoilers. No. <laughs> Hopefully the question mark's gonna pop up in a different color other than gray, otherwise I might not be able to see it on that thing. I don't know, these pixels. White and big? It's white and small. Max? You want a resource on Max? I tried to make a Max once. Let me see if I can find the page that had Mac. It was Beren.ru, but it was a particular page on it. This is... a resource on Max. But you can see it's a really small little guy. It's sort of like uh, Dream Chaser, but then it has this huge uh, hydrogen and kerosene oxygen tank, and then it was on top of uh, AN-225. Celeron CPU? Is that allowed? I've only ever seen one uh, launch, and that was actually a Cygnus too, but it was a Cygnus on an Atlas V at Cape Canaveral. Okay, yeah, I, I don't have patience for this. <laughs> Eventually, I'm sure it'll give me a question mark. No, there's no mod. There's just stock. Stock in 1.8. Nothing else. No, no mods at all. 
Hello, and sister. I'm doing well. How are you? So I'm going to... We're going to follow with our Duna missions now. 